thank you, Ariana and Jen, for being here today. Um, so I was telling Ariana backstage that I'm actually wearing the same dress today that I am wearing in my headshot in the program, which is really inspired by her and her program to get women to repeat their outfits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very grateful to you because I believe that today on International Women's Day, women need to recognize that we are at a competitive disadvantage with men because we waste an enormous amount of energy and time picking different outfits for every occasion. <laughs> so I have started a campaign, hashtag style repeats. You can get something lovely, I'm not against beautiful clothes, but wear it again and again and again. <laughs> I was in Salt Lake speaking at a conference yesterday wearing the same outfit proudly on Instagram. <laughs> and today at Levi's at conference in the same outfit and here with you in the same <laughs> outfit. And that meant I didn't have to think and I didn't have to pack a suitcase from New York. I could just have a little carry-on. Okay, that's a life hack for everybody for today. Um, so the two of you lead very, very different kinds of companies. Uh, Thrive Global is a startup. You're focused on health, wellness, sleep, which I love, I am also focused on sleep. Um, and Jen, SAP is obviously a global enterprise technology company, so you're not necessarily two people I would expect to see working together very closely, um, but that's exactly what you're doing. Uh -huh. So to get us started, can you just talk a little bit about what that partnership is and why you think it's such a good fit for both of your companies? Well, Ariane and I, and I met um, about a year and a half ago. It was before you started Thrive. I think, and we were talking about a lot of these topics, you know, the, uh, around um, being healthy and, and what it's like in the workplace today, and the vision that Ariana had with Thrive was really complementary to a lot of the things that are important in the enterprise today. And so as we thought through how do we really scale this incredible vision message, but the doing of that vision, actually putting it into action, not just talking about it, we had a beautiful partnership between Ariana's vision, our technology, and really kind of creating a different kind of employee experience. And that's what started the partnership. And the timing um, has been very important because increasingly, and I know have so many leaders in the room in the uh, human resources field, are recognizing that employees' well-being is not a soft benefit, is not sort of a nice to have. It's absolutely essential for the bottom line. It affects the culture you build. It affects performance. So we have so much data now about the connection between well-being and performance. And that's why we're excited to partner with SAP to bring all the work we've done around behavior change that improves well-being and performance at the same time to their success factors, customers, and all around the world. Because stress and burnout have become global epidemics. And they are clearly affecting everything from behavior in the workplace to attrition, to healthcare costs, to productivity and engagement. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the latest Gallup poll that 87% of employees globally are not fully engaged at work. 87. Yes. Lots. So that is like a major problem that we need to address. And as you know, one of the reasons for that is our growing addiction to our phones. Mm -hmm. So people may be at work but not really fully present at work, but continuously distracted. So in fact, the first module that we launched together with SAP was called Unplug and Recharge around our relationship with our phones and how can we take back mm. control of our time and attention. Mm. Um, I'm curious how many people in this room are, are thinking about these issues for yourself, um, trying to create more balance, trying to avoid burnout, deal with stress. Um, if you are, if that's something you're thinking about and consciously working on, can you put your hand up and just let us know? Okay, it's a lot of people. And how many of you feel like you are making significant progress in that area? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I wanted to talk about. So one thing that is, really strikes me about wellness and work is that it's stuff we know we should do. Um, but it seems like the really doing it and applying it on a daily basis is, is where we um, can't quite achieve it. So is that something that the platform is 
working on helping people with to actually make this reoccurring behaviors that we can actually implement to make progress? Yeah, I think it starts, it starts with leadership and it starts with role modeling. And you know, I think many of us who are you know, maybe a decade or more into our careers, you, know, you kind of grow up thinking that putting in more hours is, is what you're supposed to do and you know, being quiet if you want to take your kids to school, like let's not talk about that, don't tell anybody I'm leaving to go see my child's conference or that I'm gonna leave early to go exercise. It, it was almost like that was you know, a secret you wanted to keep. And I think leaders have to role, role model the behaviors that we're talking about and make it okay for everybody else. And um, that is contagious. Mm. When people see that happening and people understand, you always say we're not paying people for their perseverance, right? We're paying people for the outcomes that they create. And so I think, I think it has to start there and we have to be okay about, hey, I get eight hours of sleep a night and that doesn't make me lazy. That makes me really productive and successful. Yes, and I think the way though, to your point, of how do we actually go from knowing what to do to actually doing it. Uh, what we are doing at Thrive is we have a media platform that puts together the latest data about the connection between well-being and performance, but also amazing new role models. Mm -hmm. Because people learn through a combination of data and stories. Mm -hmm. So um, when, for example, we did a piece with Jeff Bezos, and the headline was, why am I sleeping eight hours a night is good for Amazon shareholders. Mm -hmm. And he analyzed his decision making, and he wrote that when he gets six hours of sleep, his decisions he has noticed are five to 20% less good. Um, and, as he, and as he put it, you know, uh, uh, the future of Amazon depends on the quality of his decisions, not the quantity of his decisions. A lot of leaders can identify because I'm sure every leader in the room can remember a time when you were tired and exhausted and running on empty and you made a mistake. I mean, I can identify every mistake I've made uh, in my business life and mostly they were hiring mistakes, right? Are there any bigger mistakes? Um, <laughs> and they were when I was exhausted and I was basically ignoring the red flags or not even noticing them or wanting to check something off my to-do list to be less overwhelmed. And so we bring together all these role models, whether it's um, sleep or exercise or our relationship with our phones, and that then becomes a content that we feed into our enterprise customers, our sustainability newsletters. Because you know, one of the problems with sustainability is that the content is not very compelling and engaging. So it feels like eat your broccoli. So, you know, we try to make it really compelling. I mean, in our e-course on sleep and meditation, the guest teacher is Kobe Bryant. So that's something you may want to watch even in your time off. So you are more likely to watch it, be engaged, and, and, um, imp and ad adopt some behavior change. Mm -hmm. um, and from this idea of role modeling and seeing people actually putting this into practice and saying that, yes, this is important. Have you found ways in your own organizations that you personally can send that message to the people that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's leading by example, and I think, it's, I think it's, it's being authentic. You know, I was with our employees at our, um, in, in our office in Palo Alto earlier today having a conversation about, you know, work-life balance, my career journey, everything else, and I think, all of us who are in business, when, when, you're, when you're rising up and you look at the top leaders in your company, I think all of us tend to think that they have it all figured out, right? There's a special answer key there that you will be exposed to it someday. It will be passed on to you. And the reality is, well, if there is one, maybe everybody else has it, but I don't. I haven't found it yet. And, um, and so I just, I think it's really, really important that as leaders, we share the reality of the struggles, the challenges, and share what works for us. And, and, and take those experiences. And I think technology today is a beautiful thing because technology can now allow us to engage in a very meaningful, personal way at scale. And, that's, and it's not just at the time of the event. I mean, traditionally, all of us who have been in HR, HR has been a very much an event-driven business. Mm -hmm. And today, 
you know, the leaders that we talk to really want to change it into more of an upstream experience. How can you, how can you prepare for the event, whether it's a promotion or somebody who might be returning from maternity leave? We have a lot of learnings and understandings about what happens and what people go through. How do we prepare people for that? And how do we create that better experience for them personally, for their families? And that's going to result in great places to work and more success. So that's actually one of the things I'm most excited about our partnership because uh, SAP has all this machine learning, you know, through Leonardo. I love the name. Leonardo is so wise. And, <laughs> and, and we have a lot of the micro steps of what people need at different moments in their life. So Leonardo can tell us that you are about to have a baby or you're about to move, or you're about to get a promotion, or we can see through Concur that you've been traveling a lot. So we can feed you micro steps for how to survive on the road, uh, how to deal with postpartum depression, which is a lot more common than we think, or um, uh, how to deal with um, being a manager for the first time. And uh, so this combination of technology and humanity is what I'm really excited about. And we call it augmented humanity. You know how everybody's obsessing about augmented reality? I think we need to obsess more about augmented humanity and bring um, that humanity into every aspect of the employee experience, from recruiting to onboarding uh, to talent development to performance evaluations. So one of the things we've developed together is something that we call the entry interview. Okay. You know, everybody knows about the exit interview. Mm -hmm. But I want to really spend a lot of time on the entry interview. And the first question we ask is, what is really important to you outside of work? Because the truth is that the whole human drives performance. If something bad is happening at home, it's going to affect your performance. You, you are not a robot, you're a human being. So we, we have some, such amazing learnings from that. Like the woman who said, what's really important to me is to take my daughter to school at 7.30 every morning. But my manager sets up 7.30 every morning conference calls. Now, when we went to her manager, it turns out the manager had no idea. You know, the manager is not a mind reader, and women are very reluctant to speak up about what's important to them, especially when it comes to children because they're afraid it's going to be seen as a sign that they're not sufficiently dedicated, they're on the mommy track. So it was an easy problem to solve. It made a huge difference to her experience and her performance. And there are so many other examples like that. And the entry interview brings all that out. So, I mean, clearly both of you are true believers on this this point, this integrating wellness with work and creating better outcomes for the business and the employees. Um, Ariana, I know you had a fairly dramatic experience that sort of brought this home for you. Would you mind telling us about that briefly? Yes, it was in 2007, so 11 years ago. It was two years into building the Huffington Post. I was a single mom, divorced, with two teenage daughters. Does anybody here have teenage daughters? <laughs> My sympathies. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> so uh, so I, th I thought, you know, okay, I'll manage somehow. I'll be superwoman. I'll just sacrifice sleep, uh, time for me, anything. So at the beginning of April 2007, I collapsed from exhaustion, sleep deprivation, and burnout, hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone. Mm. And that was the beginning of my wake-up call, and also of looking around and realizing that it wasn't just me, that hundreds of millions of people around the world are suffering from burnout. It's a true epidemic, and many of them with much worse consequences, you know, heart, heart attacks, um, diabetes, 75% of healthcare costs and healthcare problems are stress-related and preventable. So that gives us an idea of the problem and how much we could affect this problem with small behavior change micro steps. So I started bringing that coverage into HuffPost and then finally in 2016 I really wanted to devote the rest of my life to this 
and that's why I left to create Thrive. Um, so Jennifer, I hope nothing bad dramatic happened to you uh, or painful, but have you had any moments um, that were sort of an aha moment for you about this when you thought, yes, we really need to start talking more um, about burnout and about bringing wellness to work? You know, I have a, a very different angle of a story. My, my husband, I have a husband who stays at home with our two boys. I have teenage boys. And um, about five years ago, when we were on vacation, um, he hit a tree going 60 miles an hour and had, in, had a very near-death experience and um, was in the hospital in Utah for a couple weeks. And, and we got home. And, you know, my husband's the, he takes care of the family. Mm -hmm. And so we get home, and I had just gotten a promotion. And, you know, in addition to dealing with just the stress of him um, and he was bedridden and my kids and figuring out how to manage it, because he always took care of everything, I was m most stressed out about making sure nobody at work thought that I couldn't handle uh -huh. what was going on. That was my biggest concern. Mm. And I learned something uh, through that experience that, that I took with me is, you know, when, you, when, you, when something tough or terrible happens to somebody, really well-meaning people say, let me know if there's anything I can do. And I think all of us, you know, inside are thinking, can you just do it? Because I, I feel <laughs> uncomfortable saying, I could really use like a couple hoagies and some soda for lunch because I haven't been a, had a chance to go to the store, right? And I remember during that experience, the experience and, and I relate this to everything we're talking about, is we know what people need. We know when people are going through hardships or certain points in their career, we have enough knowledge and experience to understand and not have to ask. And this is the whole point around what we're talking about and how we want to bring technology to the story so that others don't have to kind of go through it. And it's tough. And I think everybody has probably many of their own stories and many that you've kept very private. Yeah. Um, so as you're out there in the marketplace, you're talking to CEOs, company leaders uh, about this about this partnership, about the platform. Um, what are you hearing? Where are we as far as how far corporate America has come in accepting that this is really an important business driver and this isn't, as you mentioned, just sort of a nice to have anymore? So that this is what is so exciting, that we are in a truly amazing time of transition. And for those who are history buffs, you know, in any time of transition, multiple behaviors are coexisting. So you have um, really progressive workplaces um, that take all that into account, that set, uh, set up clear expectations, that you are not expected to be on all night answering texts and emails. And you have... Um, um, an experience like I was speaking at City uh, two days ago and a woman stood up in the audience and said, um, I had an email from my boss last night at 9.40 that he needed a presentation by 9 a.m. this morning. Mm. So you have the whole gamut uh, of experience right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but what is amazing is that the listening has changed. Like the conversation we're having here is in the pages of the Harvard Business Review and Fortune and the Wall Street Journal. It's not just in health magazines. Yeah. So what I recommended to this woman was to talk to her manager. And I, and I said, the chances are that at least he must be vaguely aware about the conversation. <laughs> because it's pretty widespread. Yes. And so while maybe even like two years ago it would have been much more risky mm. to talk to your manager, now at least there is a bigger awareness that if employees are expected to be on all the time, they are going to be less effective in the morning. You know, just kind of the data is clear about it. The science is clear about it. Yes, yeah. And I think employees are getting a bigger voice, right? We, we are hearing so much more about purpose in business. We're hearing about investors, you know, focused on social activism, employees themselves are becoming activists within their own company around what's important to them. Companies are measuring, we measure employee trust, employee engagement, and there are correlations between those scores and how happy your employees are with your business results. Yep. So I think now what we're seeing is, I, in, Ariana's right, so many different types of businesses and it all depends on the leaders on how much they're embracing this. 
just talking it mm -hmm. versus work, uh, walking the walk. But I think right now there's, there's um, a real focus on, on doing these things, but also tying them to the financial business results. You know, I, have, I speak with a lot of CHROs who say, okay, I know this is the right thing to do, but how do I, how do I put this in perspective for my CEO and my board of directors that like, you know, eating an orange every day and taking the stairs, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying, but, but the point is, is that these aren't just great things to do, but they actually have an impact on the business. And I think that's going to be a, a next step where you're going to start to see a lot of these things that companies have done and you're going to see the impact very meaningfully um, in their results. Yeah. And also to recognize that uh, dramatic changes can start with tiny micro steps. That's at the heart of all our behavior change platforms. Um, we have hundreds of micro steps, but can I give you my two favorite ones? Please do. So um, one is how you end your day, and the other is how you begin your day. If you are going to make two little changes or introduce two little changes to your organizations, these are the two I would start with. Ending your day is more and more important because I bet everybody here never completes everything they could possibly do in the course of a day. <laughs> and I know that because you have interesting jobs, and nobody with an interesting job can complete everything. Mm -hmm. So we all have to declare an artificial end to the day. And we recommend with this micro step that you declare the artificial end to the day by turning off your phone and gently escorting it out of your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious, how many people here now sleep with your phone in your bedroom? Be honest. Oh my goodness. Still a lot. So guys yeah, still that, that's know. like the national, the national average is 70% of people sleep with their phones. And the science, you are all data driven. The science is conclusive that you are going to get a better night's sleep if you don't sleep with your phone by your bed. It goes way beyond the blue light, even if you had it in airplane mode. It has to do with the fact that the phone is the repository of every problem, every project, everything we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And we need to disconnect from all that in order to be able to sleep deeply. And if you're, if you're going to tell me that you needed to wake you up in the morning, have you thought of an old-fashioned alarm <laughs> clock? <laughs> you know, Pottery Barn has beautiful ones, $32. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, don't get a, I don't get a percentage. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, or, you know, so many people now have Alexa or Google or um, Apple, Ho Apple HomePod. Anyway, the, the morning micro step is equally important. Um, and this is most people wake up and they immediately go to their phone. So before they even are fully awake, their bodies are flooded with a cortisol stress hormone because everything is coming at them before they are prepared. So our micro step is take one minute one minute before you go to your phone to set your intention for the day, to remember whatever you are grateful for, to look forward to the day, and then go to your phone. At least you've been prepared yeah. and uh, you are ready to begin to face the challenges. So bottom line, it's micro steps. It's not overwhelming changes that can lead to transformational changes. Okay, one minute, I'm gonna try it. <laughs> Um, so it, it's hard to have this conversation about burnout and culture um, without thinking about Uber. Um, and this is obviously a company that had like one of the biggest crises, public crises around culture that we've seen. And Ariana, you're on the board of Uber. Um, you're very involved um, with trying to turn the company's culture around. I'm sure there are many, many lessons to take from that, but I'm particularly curious to hear what you found to be the most difficult part of that. What is the hardest thing to fix when a company's culture is broken? So what is interesting is that um, a lot of hyper-growth companies, both in Silicon Valley on and around the world, like most companies at the moment, are fueled by burnout. And everybody here can testify to the fact that when people are burnt out, they often act out. Like they operate from the worst. Um, and I think that's one of the things that happened at Uber. You know, a lot of the uh, sexist or unprofessional behavior was a product of burnout and also a product of um, the top performer myth. 
You know, the idea that if you're a top performer, or as I called it at the first Uber, all hands I spoke at, a brilliant jerk, <laughs> uh, well, no, no. everything is going to be forgiven you. <laughs> so I think the biggest lesson here is that a company cannot allow brilliant jerks because they're going to have a corrosive impact on the culture. And what we saw at Uber and many other companies last year is that a, a, a culture is like the company's immune system. Um, if it's not healthy and strong, it's going to have a, a real impact on the bottom line. Um, so I would be curious to hear if you guys could look ahead. Like let's say 10 years, 15 years, um, we're having this conversation about burnout, about corporate wellness. Um, what what do you expect to see? How do you think the world is going to change in this way? I'll let you lead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm incredibly optimistic. Mm. I think for the first time we have um, the data um, that shows that um, all the things we discussed here, whether it's in the C-suite or at call centers, um, if we don't um, change that behavior that's fueled by burnout and stress, the impact on attrition or on productivity or on healthcare costs is so clear that what HR professionals are doing is really now at the heart of the business. Uh, it's no longer as it used to be in some businesses um, on the side. It's yep. sort of hardcore, it's part of the calculations of a CEO, a CFO, and, and that's why I'm so optimistic that uh, when it comes to recruitment, especially, um, millennials are going to gravitate to the best places to work. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when it comes to keeping employees, you know, as we know, burnt out employees have an over 30% uh, chance of leaving the company. Um, so all those factors um, are, I think, going to lead to a, a great acceleration hmm. in the way um, companies operate themselves. And the Me Too movement is helping hmm. because the Me Too movement is encouraging HR professionals to, um, to create a culture of directness. We have Very a module that we call Compassionate Directness, yeah. which encourages employees to speak out to speak out about anything and not to be afraid that there's going to be retaliation uh, or that their careers are going to be affected. And that is going to be a hugely positive result when it comes to um, employee culture. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, Jen, you know, we talked a little bit about startups and, and the cultural issues that happen with startups. Um, I'm sure culture at a global company like SAP it has completely different issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly wondering, you know, as you're a company that's, you know, in so many countries with yes. people with so many different backgrounds, how do you think about creating a cohesive culture that, that, that everyone feels like this is the SAP way? Yeah. It, it's interesting because it is quite different when you think about building a culture in a 90,000 person organization that's 46 years old. Um, and you want to, for a lot of companies out there today, I think what a lot of companies are really focused on is um, there are these iconic brands out there and they want to hold on and honor the great things that made these brands and these companies so great, but also be willing to kind of continually reinvent themselves. So you have to kind of find that balance. I and mean, we have five generations across SAP and a very global company. And so it's exciting because when you go into a meeting, I mean, typically you have somebody from every part of the world. And I think when you start to expose more and more people to that experience, people get a real strong appreciation for the value of diversity, the value of different thinking. And again, it becomes contagious. So for us, you know, it's important to have folks who, we have folks who've worked there 20 years, um, we have folks who've worked there 20 hours. And, and it's really exciting to be able to see that they can get a same cultural experience both within one country, but also have the ability in the world that we're living in with technology to be able to get the same similar experience, of course, honoring and valuing the different cultures in other countries of SAP. And so it's really exciting, because you have to do both. You have to honor the legacy but you have to be really open to thinking the next 46 years will be better 
from the past, and that's a great thing. Um, so we are running out of time, but uh, before we go, you know, as Ariana mentioned, today is International Women's Day. So I just want to ask you guys to just address the women in the room for one moment um, and to share one piece of career advice uh, that has helped you along the way and that you think might help them. I just want to say that we are at the moment in the middle of the third women's revolution. The first was giving us the vote. The second was giving us access to every profession and the top of every profession, still an incomplete revolution. But the third women's revolution is very exciting because it's women saying we don't want just to be on top of the world the way you men have designed it because it's not working. <laughs> and so, Women are redesigning workplaces. Women are leading the way in redesigning the way we work, the way we live, and you know who are going to be the most grateful people in the world? Men. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, it's interesting. I think um, over the years, uh, historically, I think many of us, many of the women in the room who have maybe been in the workplace for some time, a lot of the qualities that women naturally possess, empathy, humility, vulnerability. And when I say vulnerability, that's not weakness. Vulnerability is willing to open yourself up, authenticity. In the past, these were traits that I think women were taught to, you know, kind of not show. You know, those aren't, those aren't leadership traits. You need to be a certain way and conform to a certain way. And I think now we're in a world where people want to work for I always talk about being um, perfectly imperfect, right? People want to work for human beings in this digital age. And so I think those, those characteristics that I just mentioned, that many of, many of the great people in this room have, men and women, by the way, um, lead with those. And don't think that those are qualities that you can't lead with and be successful with um, as you move forward. I think being your true authentic self um, captures more followership and uh, creates a lot more success than trying to be somebody that you're not. Okay, I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you both so Thank much. You. Thank you.